You were a tenured professor, then at 40 years old, you decided to quit your cushy job to sell aquarium fish out of your basement. People need to hear your story. Today's guest is the founder and CEO of Dan's Fish, where he not only runs a seven-figure business, but also a successful YouTube channel, each focused on driving his mission to humanely source and transport fish. Yes, you heard that right, fish. Welcome, Dan. Good to be here, guys. Thanks for having me. You've done what the majority of people only dream about. You quit your job to pursue your entrepreneurial aspirations, and it sounds like so far so good, but we'll get into that later. But I'm curious, what led you to make that decision? Oh man, I wanted to be happy. Awesome is is that's that's really what it boiled down to. I just wanted to be happy. I was tired of working in organizations uh, where I didn't feel like I was happy. And I should define that a little bit. I think people define happiness differently. For me, it was just the ability to reach the potential of whatever endeavor I was involved in. And uh, basically, what happened is I was a tenured professor. Um, and the first few years we're making great progress and then things started to stagnate. Uh, the support started to kind of, the financial support from the college, uh, started to wane a little bit. They got interested in new shiny things. And then what ultimately happened was two of my coworkers retired and the college decided they did not want to rehire. They weren't going to replace them. So I was going to be a department of one. Um, and that did not sound appealing. I knew I couldn't do good work as a department of one. So that was the moment when I was like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end this, this career. And I could have gone to a different college or university or whatever, but, um, I, I've always wanted to do an aquarium fish business because I've always loved aquarium fish and I never started it because I didn't see a model that worked. I worked at lots of little mom and pop pet stores growing up and they all struggled so bad. Um, and so I was like, well, I'm not going to do that. I'll just do aquariums as a hobby because I don't see a way to make a good living doing it. But then the internet came along and people got comfortable enough buying things online that, uh, they even got comfortable buying aquarium fish online. And so I found a model that worked and that's why I made the jump. I was in a position where I wasn't going to be able to do much. It was stagnating and I get bored real fast when stuff stagnates. I'm guessing you don't get too bored these days in your fish business. <laughs> no, we're never done. Like we go, I, I mean, it's seven days a week, um, long hours. I finally got to the point recently where I'm trying to take one day off a week to hang out with the wife and kids, but, um, even that doesn't always work. Yeah. I I'm curious. Are you able to, especially since you're standing up now, tilt your camera so people can see any of the fish warehouse or is it going to mess up your setup too much? Yeah. So, um, this is, this podcast is taking place in a working aquarium fish warehouse. So there are tons of aquariums and fish around us. There's tons of equipment. Um, People are feeding fish and stuff. So there might be some noise here, but that's just because you're in the belly of the beast. But I'll turn the camera. I have some of the lights tilted up so that they kind of shine on me for the camera, but I think you'll be able to see stuff. Um, I have this fancy curtain behind me. And then apart from that, this is just one row of our aquariums. Um, there's about 450 aquariums in this building. Um, that's kind of what I can show you without taking the camera off the stand and readjusting everything. Yeah, there's about 450 tanks going in this in this building. And then how many fish uh, that make up the 450? I don't know. I don't hey, know. Can you please tell no, me about it? Yeah. <laughs> I, people ask me that all the time. All the time. How many fish do you have? And I'm like, well, I know I've got 450 tanks. Do you have a mascot? Yeah, we do. Um, it's a puffer. Its name is Mouth. And what Mouth is is a dragon puffer. It looks like a potato with a big mouth. It's a sit and wait predator. So it literally, it literally just sits in the aquarium like a rock and waits for a fish to swim in front of it. And then its mouth goes boom and it clamps down on it. And um, basically we use mouth to take care of any fish that are, uh, you know, have deformed spines or stuff like that. So mouth gets a delicious meal and we don't sell deformed fish. That's how that works. So mouth has been with me for several years. Yeah. What does an average day look like for you with 
the 450 tanks around you? I wouldn't say there is an average day because I see my job as the CEO of this company to be the guy that makes it possible for everyone else to do their job. So I come in and I have a list of stuff I would like to do. And I have some priority items that I'm going to get done no matter what. But apart from that, the day varies based on what other people need, what difficulties the team is facing, that I can uh, lessen their pain points and make it so they can do their job while I take care of this stuff that would distract them from their job. So basically, I do that. And then as those pain points are identified, um, if they're easily solved, great. If not, then it's my job to figure out a, a permanent solution. Well, the, the team helps me figure that out, but it's my job to make it possible to make that pain point go away completely. So I never have the same day twice to tell you the truth. I have a long list of stuff I could get to if nothing, if nobody needed something and I get to as much of that as I can. But really what I'm trying to do is empower people and give them the tools they need so they can work autonomously without me. So I spend a lot of time doing that. What's inspired your approach to leadership? Because what you just described, I think, is a very uh, art. And I would both look at it and be like, it's a great way to lead, but not everybody looks at the same um, philosophy. So I'm just curious, what's influenced that for you? Well, part of it is practical. I literally have to trust people to do things. Um, if I tried to severely micromanage everything, we would not be able to scale. We just could not grow this company and scale it up. So part of it is a practical need to hire people in positions that are smart and that are bought into the mission and then free them to do their work and make it possible. Um, I really think that's it. The, the other thing is I'm trying to build a company where people want to work. And I, I'm familiar with Zappos and all kinds of models. Uh, Happiness Inc. is a documentary I've read about a software company and how they operate. And there's some like frou-frou stuff that you read about how to do this. But I think practically what it is, is do you have a mission that is very clear and that the people in your company are passionate about and have you given them the tools to unleash their passion? I think if you do those two things, if it's clear what we're going for, and by the way, you have carte blanche to figure out how to do that, then I think that creates happiness because then you have what you do as an employee at any level makes a difference because you're forwarding the mission. It isn't, I'm doing this because I was told to do it. It's, hey, I want to try this because I think it would result in this effect that would forward our mission. I love the simplicity of that th description. I love it. Yeah, that's really, to me, that's what happiness is at work. It's feeling fulfilled at work. And the way to feel fulfilled is to have some buy-in in the process and know why you're doing it. And we ask four questions every time someone wants to try something. The first is, is this good for our fish? The second is, is this good for the customer? The third is, does it forward the mission? Which if it does the first two things, it probably does that thing. And then the last one is, is it supported by data? So those are the questions we ask. Is this good for the fish, the customer? How does it forward our mission? And is that supported by data? And if the first two or three are answered, but we don't have the data yet, it's what do we need to do to get the data to see if we should proceed? And we have a weekly all hands meeting where everyone is free to bring proposals, they go through that that filter and they know that and they'll say, hey, this happened. I think if we tweaked it this way, this would be the result. Um, and we'll be like, okay, let's try it one day next week and collect some data or something like that. So to me, that's what it is. No, it's great. Like what you just described is actually something that a lot of um, uh, Fortune 500 companies still fail at. So that's why I want to just highlight that even though, you know, for you, some of the stuff that you mentioned might be practical and it might just seem like this is just how you approach. Your approach is actually one of those that sadly, I think a lot of businesses don't, you know, fall through with. And you mentioned something else as well about, um, you know, what you do try to create for the team. And it um, takes me back to, again, I, I bring it up a few times because at Dan's Pink book drive, he talks about the core motivators. You provide people with three things, which is 
um, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And I think that's something that you've done well. Purpose is a lot of people want to join um, because they believe in your your mission. Um, autonomy is what you just kind of described, that you're like, hey, here's high level what you need to do. Let's do it. And then through this, they also get mastery of it all. So I think that's pretty incredible, even if you know you make it sound like you just stumbled upon um, this. That's, that's, that's great. You know, I was familiar with lots of different philosophies about it. I wanted to build a culture that was productive and, and that people felt uh, fulfilled with. Those are the two main things of the culture. How do you be productive while making people feel fulfilled? Um, and ultimately, what winnowed out, a lot of stuff was just practical limitations. So stuff like, we need to have a weekly lunch together, or we need to do this or that or whatever. We're too busy. And um, there's been times definitely in the company where it's like, we don't even want to spend the funds on that because we need inventory so bad that just a few hundred bucks could make a difference right now early on in the company. And so practically, it wasn't like a mastermind of, um, I'm going to study all this and then come to the right thing. It was, here's all the possibilities. And then the furnace of doing this, it kind of got melted down to the essentials. Everything else kind of got put aside. We're too busy. We couldn't do it. So that's how that kind of came to pass. You said winnowed out, and I wanted to make a minnow joke in there, but I missed my opportunity, so I'll just... <laughs> but the mission, could you just share a little bit about your um, mission? Because I think that it's felt like, you know, to me, based on what I understand of your story, a huge benefit, though, too, because I know then it leads into a lot of, like, your um, social media and your YouTube presence and what you do there, what people buy into. So can you share a little bit about your mission, how you built a community? The mission uh, came organically i've been keeping aquarium fish since the summer between my between sixth grade and seventh grade i think i was maybe 13 years old when i started keeping fish uh mike was there for that we were we were friends growing up went to the same junior high back in the day and i think that's correct around 13 years old and i've kept fish my whole life pretty much since then i don't know what it is about them but i love them there's something so fascinating the same thing that happens when you sit and watch a fire and the flames kind of mesmerize you and you go deep in yourself and you have that relaxing, almost meditative state or when you're sitting by the ocean and the waves are washing in and out. I get that when I hang out by my aquariums. Um, it's it's almost a mental health or kind of grounding thing. Which there's the science that backs up. Oh, yeah. There is some science. We'll get into the science later if you want. But anyway, that's, I think, why I like them so much. So I've always kept them. I've worked at various areas of the industry from pet stores to large distributors and stuff. And all throughout that, when people would come over and see my aquariums, I would hear this narrative. I would hear people say, oh, I used to keep fish, but they all died. I heard that narrative over and over and over through the years. And as I started working in the industry and got more experience in it, I started to understand why people were being unsuccessful with fish. And there's two reasons. And my mission springs from those two reasons. The first is just ignorance. If you don't know the basics of how to set up an aquarium um, and set up a ecosystem that's stable, but there's a few key things you need to know to make it happen. Without those, it won't work. So there's a little bit of education. And we do a weekly live stream on YouTube every Wednesday night at um, 9 p.m. Eastern where people can I'm live on YouTube at the Dance Fish channel. People ask me questions about how to take care of fish. So I feel like I'm kind of helping educate on that side. But there's a big problem that can't be solved easily, and that is the industry itself. The supply chain is brutal. It is, I call it a meat grinder. Basically, the fish um, that go through this supply chain, they're in very crowded conditions. They're not fed and cared for properly throughout their journey through the, from collector or breeder all the way down to the pet store. And so when they end up at the pet store, they're very stressed. They're listed for sale immediately. And when little Johnny or Susie goes and says, mommy, I want that one, it looks good. But what they don't know is it's so stressed that its immune system is compromised. They take it home and it succumbs to disease within a week or two. And that's the narrative I heard over and over and over. I tried to keep fish, but they all died. So I was like, what can I do to change that? So I built a company to change that. The way we deal with the supply chain is very different than any other company. And we take the time here to quarantine each batch of fish, um, to 
give them a couple of weeks to recover from travel, get healthy, get their immune system back up to par before we send them to the customer. And when we source fish, we source them very differently than most of the chain. We, we source directly from the breeder or collector when possible, and that's often possible. When we can't do that. There might be one middleman between us, but usually there's five or six or seven middlemen, and each step on that chain is stressful for the fish. So our fish might be in transit for a couple of days versus a couple of weeks. And we also have our suppliers. We only work with suppliers that pack according to our specifications. So if they would normally put hundreds of fish in a single bag, we're like, why don't you put 50 fish in that bag? They'll be less crowded. There'll be less toxins in the bag. And um, so the fish come to us healthier. They're treated more humanely. They're quarantined. They get to become vigorous. We call it fat and sassy before we list them for sale to our customers. And then we ship to our customers very differently. So at each step on the chain, we're trying to be humane and do right by the fish. We're doing that so when the customer receives the fish, it is, its immune system is strong. It isn't fresh off this, this horrible meat grinder of an experience. And so the fish will thrive for the customer. So that's what we've done to change the narrative in the aquarium industry from, I used to keep fish, but they all died too. I love my fish. I come home from work. I watch them for 10 minutes. I, it chills me out. I'm a better father or friend or husband or partner or whatever, because now I'm in a better place after the stress of work. So that's our mission, to change the narrative in the aquarium fish industry. And that's the story behind why we do that. Another way to describe it is we want to be the fish store a fish would choose to go to if it could choose which fish store it ended up. That's awesome. I, I think what you just described there too, it's probably more than anybody's ever thought about or known about um, how fish even get to a location or place. Most people just show up there, the fish is there, that's all they think about. Um, so with that, you you built this audience and you mentioned it, and um, or, or community rather, not an audience, you built a community. And it's really impressive. And a lot of people want to do that, but you've really done so. And you mentioned your once a week live stream is one way to do it. You also release videos on your uh, channel where people can get, you know, a cool sneak peek into your business and, and even more of, of how, you know, you, you, you do what you do uh, with and for um, fish and with your team. Uh, but you also do something interesting that you put out there and you um, celebrate as well as hold yourself and your team accountable around. And that's that you have a, a metric around how many fish arrive to people, um, I guess, alive, right? Yeah, we call it a shipping report. So the claim we're making is that there's a better way for this industry to operate. In order for people to buy into that, they have to know it's true. And in order for them to know it's true, we have to be transparent, like completely transparent on what we're trying to do and if we're successful or not. So every week when I get on um, the, the live stream, I start that live stream with what we call the shipping report. And I tell people something like, here's how many fish had problems. Here's the percentage of fish that didn't do well. And I'll cite the fish often so people actually know. Um, in that way, if you received an order from me and it was a disaster and I don't talk about that, then you can call me out live on, on YouTube, on the live chat and say, actually, he's long. if five people are all like, no, no, it's not, all my orders are horrible, then you know that there's a problem. Um, there's only two things we don't divulge. It's who our suppliers are and exactly what our sales are. And the reason is, is it's taken me a long time to find these suppliers and to develop the relationship with them. And I don't want to give that away free to competitors. That would just be silly. And I want to keep my competitors guessing at exactly where we stand market share wise. Um, so those are the only two things we don't divulge. Everything else is transparent. We'll run a list on the side here that sends them a whole nother direction of the list that you work with. So we'll trick them. We'll send them yeah, somewhere down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just scrolling down. <laughs> The way we build our community and said is we've said there's got to be a better way for this industry to operate. We want to do that. Here's how we're going to do that. And then being completely transparent with them on our journey to make that happen. 
So they trust that what we're saying we're doing is what we're actually doing. Every company in the world says it's great and it cares, no matter what industry it's in, and that it operates to the highest standards and all this. Everyone claims that. So we don't believe anyone when they say that. We only believe people when they show that. So that's what we're doing. Do you ever think you get to a place where it won't be you doing that live report? Um, no, I don't think so, unless it's kind of far in the future. First of all, I really enjoy the live stream. Um, until So I live in Sheridan, Wyoming. It's this tiny town of 18,000 people in a state that only has half a million people in the entire state. Before I moved here, I lived in cities that had fish clubs. And one of my favorite things to do on weekends would go to aquarium fish clubs and geek out with other people that liked fish and, you know, trade fish and talk fish. I know I'm a huge nerd. I know. I know. But everyone needs to be passionately weird about something. And for me, it just happens to be fish. I'm not sure why. Anyway, I miss that. I'm out here in the middle of Wyoming. I don't have that. And so I get that fix live on YouTube every week. I really enjoy it. So I don't, I don't see a reason to stop. I'm not, I started that before I ever had the business. I was just doing it for funsies and I'll continue to do it. It's such a unique thing for people to have that chance of that interaction with an essence, a CEO of a company, let alone an expert like yourself. And that's why I think it's great. I think it's really unique that you do so. And I think it's rare that you find that out there. So that's me, you know, celebrating it and saying, that's really amazing. What is also unique and rare is to geek out over something so passionately and you'd be able to turn it into a business. Uh, Cause I think that's rare. Not, there's not a lot of people that are able to be passionate about something and become a profitable business. It usually stays a hobby. Why would you start a business you're not passionate about? Elon Musk described it really well. It's like, what did he say? Staring into the abyss while chewing on broken glass, something like that. Like there are times when you're starting a business where that's a great description. <laughs> like, if you're not passionate about the thing, how in the world are you going to overcome all the obstacles? Like, seriously, for years, seven days a week working, um, like grinding out from early in the morning until I was exhausted and had to sleep, would take a break, maybe to have a meal with my family, um, try to take a break for a couple hours once a week to, you know, get remember who my kids are and see them. But besides that, it was just grinding year after year, um, for a couple of years. No one's going to do that and sustain that if they're not passionate about what they're doing. Now, if you're passionate about business itself, then that's fine. Then you can choose lots of different things to do as long as you're truly passionate about what you're doing. But man, there's no reason to go through the pain of starting an enterprise if you don't absolutely love it. Like, why? Just be secure in a job that'll take care of you. There's plenty of high-paying jobs out there that you can be secure in and not truly passionate about. It's a lot easier than running a business you're not passionate about. So on there, because you mentioned the word um, security, and I think what stops a lot of people from pursuing, um, you know, they're following their passion or just starting a business in general is setting themselves up in a way where they can. So curious to hear a little bit more about that story, about how did you set yourself up? Like, was there a safety net? Like, how did you prepare your family when you basically said to them, hey, you know, those fish I have down in the basement, we're going big. Like, what Yeah, how, what happened? Uh, hey, honey, I'm quitting my, you know, secure tenured professorship with health benefits and good pay. Right. For hanging out in the basement all But day. the fish yeah. will take care of us, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um... I had about a year. What happened was when my coworkers retired, I went to the dean and I was like, all right, let's put out a job description. Let's figure out what we want, you know, because I thought we were going to rehire and, you know, progress as a department. When they were like, oh, we don't know we're doing that. I told them at that time, I said, okay, well, I'm not interested in being a department of one. So we have a year. If at the end of the year, there hasn't been progress on this. I don't know if this is going to be sustainable for me is kind of how I worded it. So knowing that, I already had a basement full of fish because, again, I've been keeping them as a hobby forever, and I'm weird about it. One tank wasn't enough. Like, I, I needed a whole basement full. <laughs> so I already had that. 
So what I started doing was actively selling them. I, I did a side hustle and I did that because I wanted to collect data. So the reason I spent a year just as a side hustle is so I could figure out my real landed costs, um, industry suppliers that would do things in a more humane way and collect all the data. So at the end of that year, I could formulate a business model that was not just based on what I thought would happen, but the, what had actually happened for a year. So I did that. I looked at that model and based on that, I was able to extrapolate and get a pretty good sense that this is something that had the possibility of actually working as a business that you could make a living doing. And so um, once I had that, then on my 40th birthday, I walked into the dean's office and my, my birthday present to myself was quitting that job and launching this passion project. But it would have been foolish to do that without enough data to have a business plan that I could model out into the future I won't say accurately, but it hasn't been very inaccurately to have a sense of what it is. Um, now, I've got a, a wife and kids and mortgage and all that. If I didn't, if I was 18 and didn't have those responsibilities, then maybe it doesn't matter as much. But I needed to know that, um, that this had a good chance of success because I had a lot to lose. When you did that, though, um, did you set aside a certain amount of like savings where you're like, this is what I need because this is how long it's going to take to get to this, you know, forecasted revenue that's going to let you move off of top ramen or is it <laughs> whatever that looked like for you? No, I liquidated my savings. I liquidated my retirement. I went all in. There's no plan B. This has to work. Um, and I put myself in a position where I had to make it work. Now, I did that partly out of necessity because in order to scale to the next size, I funded that myself because um, I wanted to click down on what happened when we scaled a bit and um, I didn't have enough free cash to do that and have a bunch of savings. So I liquidated everything. So instead of having cash reserves, my wife and I went through everything and said, what can we cut our spending on? So we didn't increase reserves before we went in. Instead, we, we uh, curtailed our spending is how we managed that. Amazing. And we had enough of that year that if, if we curtailed our spending enough, we could, you, had the year. you know, scrape by. Yeah. And were your kids some of your original employees? Were they packing fish? Yeah, a, a little bit here and there. I would have them help do that. My wife would help as well. Not a lot, though. They are interested in it. And I don't want, I want them free to pursue their passions so they can do something that they're happy with later in life as well for a living. And so every now and then I would need the help and be like, Hey, come down. You know, uh, I'm not going to get these orders out on time without help. But besides that, every now and then they would come down and help out. But if I had forced them to do it, it would have been something that, that, you know how you can just turn someone against something by forcing them to do it because they don't want to. I'm trying to run that balance right now with, with content creation of my yeah. kids because they like, they enjoy a YouTube channel and I'm, you know, I'm trying to find that balance that doesn't feel like a job. You, you mentioned something, um, you know, when it did come to you do, you looking at the data and, and determining a plan. Well, at, at some point you then decided, okay, you were going to um, fund this initially yourself, but that you would go after some investors. In fact, the warehouse you're in, you, you built with the help of, of investors, if I'm not mistaken. Could you describe a little bit more of that story and how you found these investors? First of all, we, just so people understand, we did we do have investors, but it's not the majority of it at all, um, investors. But we did need some help. The way we did that was, before I ever thought of doing this as a living, I did it for fun. I was on YouTube and I would do a weekly live stream and I'd make videos about breeding fish and caring for fish because I enjoyed doing it. And so I had a very small following, small but loyal following of people who were interested in that kind of stuff. And then when I started the company, um, one of the reasons the company is successful is because our mission is meaningful, not just to me and the people that work here, but to the fish nerd community. People know that 
they walk into pet stores and they see sick fish all around that are listed for sale. People understand this is a problem. So when we stepped up and said, we're changing this and here's how, that kind of galvanized our community and they started telling lots of other people about it. And so that's how that all started. So we had this community that was just hobbyists and I was a hobbyist. Then as we started turning this into a business, they became our customers. And then as we scaled, they became our investors. Now that only worked though, because we had been adding value to them for years um, with no expectation of return. And then when it kind of became a thing, we, we had that, that base. That's really, really impressive because, and again, I think also out there where a lot of people want to jump into doing something um, without building that community. I know that's been something that you've been, uh, you pushed me on at times too about, hey, yeah, you know, it's like, because for you, that just, that made it that much easier for all the other things that you wanted to do later. No, absolutely. I, I just don't know why someone would invest in you, um, in you in general term. Yeah. If you haven't invested in, if they didn't, if you hadn't proven some kind of value, right. You know, yeah. so yeah, you've already invested enough time in your own, I don't, again, I don't want to say passion, but the thing that you were pursuing that it's, it's kind of like when I think about, um, some of these unicorns of the world, you know, when you think about the, the, uh, Ubers, uh, and you know, at one point the Facebooks, the others out there, it's like, you want to know that somebody else has, is got a lot of the skin in the game and are really, um, invested in it. And obviously you were at this time cause you had started growing this while, um, just as a hobby, you weren't even expecting anything out of it as you pivoted. And I was going to ask you what your, um, edge was, but it sounds like you might've said it, or do you feel that is right. Is that community was your edge or do you think there are other things that gave you an edge in getting to a point where I should say you are now, you know, just about out of that startup phase. I think if you've, you've called it, maybe not just yet, but you're right at the cusp, um, which is really impressive. And I'm just, yeah, curious what gave you that edge where others don't succeed. There are other people with communities, social media communities, but without a clearly defined mission, you need both. You need to galvanize a community around a mission. And that community includes your employees. That's your, your employees, your customers. Um, we're very expensive because of the way we source our fish. The freight on our fish is at least double what everyone else is paying in this industry. We do that so they're not so crowded, so they get to us healthier. Um, we take at least two weeks. Sometimes it can be a couple months, depending on the fish's needs to get the fish healthy and recovered. And we never send a fish out unless it's like, we think this thing is bulletproof. If I don't think my grandma could keep it alive, I'm not going to send it to a customer, that kind of mentality. Um, so there's a lot of time and labor involved in that. So you can find, I'll give you an example. You can find a neon Tetra at Petco for 99 cents. We sell ours for 5.99. The reason is, is if I sell it for less than 5.99, I'm, I might as well light money on fire just because with all the labor and everything we do, that's kind of the base cost we can sell something for, but people do it because they know we've demonstrated to them that here's what our mission is and we're actually doing it. So they know that we source them more humanely than the industry does on average or at all, really. They know that we paid extra to make that happen. They know that we took the time to get them healthy. That we had a veterinarian in residence this last summer that helped with that and everything. Um, so we actually are working with experts to teach us about how to care for the fish and identify disease and things. That all costs money. Um, and when we send our fish to our customers, each one goes as its own little travel pod, one fish per container. And that takes a ton of labor. But the moment a customer opens a box and sees the difference, in three months later, they still have the fish they bought from us and they're all alive and thriving, which happens over 98% of the time. Um, they're going to come back again and again. So because of that, we have a very loyal customer base who's also, in most cases, our community that is following our mission and seeing we're making right on it. So I think what you need, if you're going to start a company that 
There's two ways to do it. You can have all the money to bypass a lot of things and hire people um, with high salaries to bring them in and get them to work for money. You can do that. And there are companies that raise tons of money in order to do that. Or you can have people come work with you because of they believe in what you're doing and you can have a customer base that sees the value you're adding. Or you can do both, I guess. Um, but if you were to start a company kind of on a shoestring in your basement like I did, I would say have a clear mission that is meaningful in your area, whatever your domain of business is, that people say, yes, that needs to happen. We want to support that happening. So have a mission that will make people um, galvanize towards you. Um, actually, galvanize is the wrong term. That will make people want to support you because they believe in what you're doing. And then a community that you can galvanize around that mission. I think you need those two things. Or you need a bunch of money in order to bypass some of that. And just do it through marketing and the traditional way any tech startup would traditionally work. I think when you mention that with the money, though, I think when there's a few different good shows out there that are looking at how the Ubers and the WeWorks grew when they had this, I don't want to call it unlimited money, but in a way, they did have that. And in that case, they might have tried to really get people, got, well, again, as you said, maybe Galvanize is not the best word, but, you know, really around this this mission. But I think what had happened with them is sometimes that unlimited funds got in the way because sometimes then they weren't actually making the thoughtful decisions for the culture and other things, which you could see that you are constantly thinking about what is right and what's best. And you have your team thinking that same sort of way when you're like, okay, where do we invest, you know, um, or reinvest our dollars of the company, so. I would like to have money. We could have scaled this up quicker, but um, but there has been a lot we've learned because we didn't have it, and so we had to make things work, and so we got very precise in our operations. Our operations are pretty tight. To do all the steps we do as we source, care for, and transport fish to our customers is that's a moat for us. It's going to be very difficult for another company to start up and be able to do the quality we do because the operations to achieve that, it's not easy. Um, it's a lot easier to grab a bag, throw a dozen fish in it, put it in a box and send it right off. You know, that's, that's easy. Your attention to quality is impressive. And I think people appreciate quality and that's why the loyal customer base is there. Um, so that, that's, that's impressive. I don't think... I think once c companies scale, the first thing that goes is quality. Yes. I, and I, I get that temptation because there's so much I could be doing to scale faster if I let that go. Um, so I understand that temptation. I understand how it would be easy to um, just say, well, just for now, we're going to make this exception or something. But for a business set up like I am, reputation's everything. And it doesn't take... It takes a long time to build that reputation because you have to actually operate like you say you're operating and you have to provide the difference or the value that you say you're going to do or there's no reason to pay six times as much for a Neon Tetra from you. There, there's just no reason to buy from us if we're not actually doing what we say we're going to do. But when people experience it, then they're loyal and they tell their friends. Um so it takes a long time to build that up that enough people see the difference and tell their friends and everything. Because you can, you can tell people all day long, but until they experience it, no one's going to believe it. Um, but it only takes a few bad experiences for that reputation to be torn down. It's, it's much quicker to tear down a company's reputation than it is for them to build it. And so we are just, um, part of it is paranoia maybe, that it took us this long and this much work to get here, we're not letting anything jeopardize that because the pain of building that back would be even more extreme after a ding like that than the pain of setting it up in the first place. And I don't think I could go through it. Um, and by the way, for anyone that wants to see our reputation, check out the reviews on dancefish.com or on Google regarding our site or check out what people say on the YouTube comments. We don't change our reviews. We don't alter our reviews. The bad ones are there. The good ones are there. You can see everything. And I think there's like 1,400 reviews on the website. So it gives you a good idea of what we're doing. 
it's amazing. Again, I'm just looking at some of the comments and uh, YouTube and the like. It's it's been pretty crazy to me to be like, wow, like hearing the way people talk about it and 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 how fanatical in some ways, you know, they are, which I I love. The other um, thing too, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you had people relocate, like uh, uh, team members relocate to Sheridan, right? Um, yeah. Yep. And and how many team members have done that? One, two, three. Johnny that I just said bye to moved here from Kentucky. Um, we had someone move here from Texas. We had someone move here from Utah. We had someone move here from Ohio. Um, and and by the way, they're moving here, but some folks have also left six figure jobs to come do this. That that's what I'm. That's incredible. That's one reason our operations are so good, is because um, this, this is another point. Hire the smart people. Hire take the. You're going to be tempted to just hire because you're feeling pain, but don't. I'd rather work 20-hour days than hire bad people. So when it gets to the point where it's like, okay, we need help. We're all here too many hours. Let's hire someone. It doesn't mean I'll have them next week. Um, it can take some time. And for us, they need to be a cultural fit which mainly means they have to be passionate about the mission and interface well with other people. I think passion shows when they decide to relocate there. So you know that one. Yeah. 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 We also bring everyone out and we fly them out. We put them up and we work with them here for a week before we make a decision. Uh, we, I, I feel like you really get to know someone in the trenches when you're pulling, you know, 16, 18 hour days with them for a week. You know, you, you start seeing the real them. Now it's not perfect. Hiring's hard. Hiring's one of the toughest things. But it's it's a if they're willing to do that and you go through that with them, that helps. Um, but the main reason we've been able to hire good people who know a lot about stuff and help make the operations really work, and um, or a software engineer that helps make our website interface well with our operations, so we're relying on, you know third-party vendors and all that to try to design the software, which can be really hard. Um, someone in-house to design software is great if you're a software-heavy company, for sure. Um, well, duh. But for a fish business, who else? I don't know another fish business that has a software engineer on the team. No, just the fact that people relocate and come to you and the fact that you get high-caliber talent because they're drawn to the, the mission, what you do, the passion, everything. Yeah, they're drawn to the mission. Exactly. So not only does... A strong mission with the galvanized community help you sell, but it helps you hire. And man, you need help hiring. You might not know it, but you're going to need help. So most of our hires come from our community. They're people that have been watching us for years. They're customers that have bought from us over and over again. They understand the difference and um, they want to be part of it. So it's funny in a day and age where, uh, Grant, and I know I'm only talking about a small subset when I look at your uh, team members, but in a day and age where people are like, can we please be remote? We don't want to have to be near, you know, the office and people are fighting for that. You know, it's interesting here to see what actually it can look like when people are really drawn to want to be in a part of it. And obviously, you know, the the uh, nature of uh, I'm sure many of your roles and especially the size, there's a huge benefit to being in person. But I'm curious, do you think you will ever be at a point where you do hire um, more remote uh, team members? I suppose there might be some jobs where that would make sense. For example, if we got to the point where we were capturing so much content and just simply couldn't get it all edited, the editor doesn't necessarily need to be local. Um, someone could write a newsletter and not be local. There's, there's lots of things that, as we grow, could possibly not be local. But for the core positions, you have to be local. Otherwise, I don't know how you have a sense of what's actually going on. Um, I think it's important, no matter how, how high up in a company you are, to occasionally step on the line and do the work um, to get back in touch um, in whatever level of the company. And, and I do that. I spend some, some time out packing fish, pulling fish, doing those things. And I, I make sure I do that fairly regularly because for a while I didn't, I got so busy and we were scaling so fast that I was like, I, I'm sorry, guys, I, you guys got that. I, I just need to focus on scaling. And I did that for a couple months and I started getting out of touch. And when I went back, there were like five things the first day when I went back and did it again, 
that I was like, oh, we could improve this and this and this. And I, I never would have seen that. So I think being in the house together is pretty important, at least for some core positions. Makes sense. And I think for your culture that you built, again, you know, I, I can see the value of what that's um, likely helped to foster, you know, even further. Uh, did you always want to be an entrepreneur or did this kind of hit you later? You know, as you say, you're 40, but you went, had the conversation like, when, when did you decide you wanted to be an entrepreneur? I think I was always an entrepreneur and had no idea that I was. Um, so when I graduated high school, I wanted to either be a veterinarian because I like animals and I figured you could make a decent living as a veterinarian or be a theater professor because I loved theater, but I wanted to have a stable life. I didn't want the, um, the tenuous life of an actor, let's say. So, um, what I ended up doing was being a theater professor and that was great in many ways, but. The times I was happiest as a theater professor was when I would go into be a new hire and have to grow the program, which is a very entrepreneurial type thing. Find facilities, um, find a student base who are basically your customers, your students. I mean, in some ways, um, get the community involved and do fundraising, all that. So the times when I was happiest was when I was just starting the new job and making the difference. And then the times when I got bored and unsatisfied was when that ended in the um, administration and bureaucracy just kind of, you were kind of just doing the same day to day and there wasn't real progress. So being a, being a professor is not very entrepreneurial. In fact, being tenured is the opposite of entrepreneurial. It's the ultimate in security. But something I learned about myself is that I don't, security is great, but stagnation for me didn't work. So I think I was an entrepreneur without realizing it. It's a very common, uh, entrepreneur story that we've heard a lot. And I, I feel like Michael and I wore that hat of an entrepreneur at Disney and Netflix too. So I think it's very relatable. What advice would you give to somebody who is, we'll go with, 40, as you'd mentioned that um, before, uh, because a lot of people hit 40, well, there's two two chances, uh, midlife crisis, or <laughs> there's the other one, or at least, you know, stereotypically, or there's the other one that's like, I'm too old, you know, to to do this. I'm already in my career. I've been here this long. Um, any particular advice that you would give somebody like that who's kind of pondering whether or not they sh themselves should um, pursue their own entrepreneurial aspirations? For me... Happiness is worth almost any cost. And I find happiness in fulfillment and I find fulfillment in progress, progressing towards something. That's, that's kind of how it works for me. So if you're the type of person that has to be um, making something happen in order to feel fulfilled, um, then I think it's worth doing whatever you have to do to make that happen in your life. Because what's life where you aren't feeling fulfilled. Like, what is that? And so everyone's, everyone's different though in how they're wired. But the way I'm wired, this is where I'm in my happiness. And even early on when I was launching this, I was also at my poorest. That's changed since. But for the first couple of years, okay, I'll tell you, for the first two years, I paid myself $1,867 a month. Like nothing. And that was just enough to pay the rent, pay electricity and water. And then my wife helped uh, with, brought in some money for like food and stuff. Um, so like, like nothing. But I was much happier then than I was in the other jobs I'd had up to that point. It's working out. The company's doubled every year since it started. We're... Um, up in the seven figures annually now, like it's, it's doing what it needs to do, but there was always a chance it wouldn't, that it would have failed. And so I think you need to have an honest discussion with yourself about if this fails, are you going to be okay with that? You know, there's, there's times when people fail at something and it literally takes them from their mental health just goes down the drain and 
we see horrible things happen. Like suicide can happen from something like that. So what are you going to do if it fails? Now, I didn't have a plan B, but if it failed, I have a skill set that I could apply many ways and I was confident that I could come up with a plan B. And also I got down to the point where my needs were so small that any, my financial needs were so small that any, um, any plan B almost could have worked for a while as I built back up. So if my needs, if my financial needs had been large, I don't think this would have worked or if I would have failed, then I would have been in real trouble. So I guess that's some things to think about. Before you launch something, I would definitely have a business plan and I would test it. I would write out my business plan and then I would do something on a small scale to test it, collect the data and see if you're even remotely right because you won't be on many things. Um, so I would know my landed costs. I would know what the margins need to be. I would basically do what I needed to do to actually understand the realities of the business that I wanted to start. So if you've decided that you can live with failure and it's worth a try, that I think would be the next step. And then based on that, it's going to be a judgment call. But get the data first. Do something on a small scale first. And I agree on the importance. I think what people struggle with there is that it's just not the sexy part. Usually it's like the idea, excited, go. I mean, that's why so many businesses fail um, because they don't do that piece that you did. And I think you increase your probability of success by going through the steps that you did or even understanding in the first place if that's the most viable um, idea. And I, and I think that sounds like that would apply. You know, I know I mentioned 40, but that could apply at 35, could apply at 30. But let's go back further. 18 years old. Dan, long, long ago, before, right when he was, uh, you know, uh, maybe maybe he had some ideas of the- I had some he, hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you and me both. Um, in fact, that's how I, I still remember. Dan, um, we were at this, you know, school dance and he actually made me afraid to ever dance because I looked at Dan and I said, is that what I look like? Um, but but, but, here, but here's the thing. It was this mixture. It was a mixture of the schoolboy walk mixed with doing this with his hair. Like again, he had he had some nice flowing hair then. Um, but what I will say about that wait, is what that one question. How many numbers did I have by the end of the night? That's what I was gonna say. That's what I was gonna say. But Dan, <laughs> Dan definitely was the popular, and it worked out for Dan. So while I might have been like, "Is that what I look like?" When I really should have, and this was a, a something I reflected on later. In the end, Dan Dan was working it. He made it. He made it work. But. So going back to that 18-year-old um, uh, version of yourself, what advice would you have today or what would you do today if you were 18 and wanting to, you know, just based on the knowledge you have now and the kind of pursuits that you made in your life? Um, the first thing I would make sure I understood, I guess, is that the trappings of success don't matter. It's actual success that matters. So... When you're young, don't be seduced by what looks like success. Don't be seduced by people driving, you know, expensive cars that are all fancy. Because the reality is they're probably up to dead up to their eyeballs trying to pay that thing off. Um, don't worry about what it looks like. Worry about what success actually means for you in this endeavor. And be laser focused on that. Nothing else matters. That would be my my big piece of advice to you know, someone young who wants to start out. If I was my 18-year-old self, this is weird coming from a college professor, but I, I, I didn't need to go to college. I don't think, I mean, there's things I learned in college. I learned uh, how to write really, really well. And I've had a lot of opportunities that came to me because I can write really, really well. But most of those opportunities were academic where you need to write really well, but also doing business plans, um, submitting materials to investors, just those basic things. Clear communication is really important, but you don't have to go to school to learn it. That's one place I learned it though. Um, I'm trying to think of other soft skill and hard skill benefits I got from school. I think another one I got was um, how to suss out um, things that were being portrayed as fact, they weren't really fact. If you dig far enough into academia, if you read a scientific study, for example, which I do a lot now, um, you can tell if a study is good or bad. Like, 
Is it actually proving what it says it's proving? So that kind of critical thinking in monitor for BS, I guess I learned some of that in school. Apart from that, I don't know what else I got out of school and I could have gotten those two things without it. So I don't know how important college is unless you're going into a field that requires it. Like, in, well, even engineering, uh, if you know how to, you need to know how to do things. That's more important, I think, than anything else. Medical, for example, might be one of those. But again, really, it's then once you're in the, um, what do you call it? Uh, you, you, in essence, have not internships, but what do they call it? Residencies. That's where you really end up learning. I think education is important. I don't know if school is once you get to the college level. Um, and what I mean by that is you better educate yourself somehow. And if you're the type of person that needs college or school to do that, do that. But if you can, I mean, you can learn anything today. The information's out there and it's usually free. So I think that is a big change. I don't think I would have gone through the 10 years it took me to get my graduate degrees and everything so I could get the professorship that I thought I wanted. So that would be a big change. What I would do if I was 18 and had and know what I knew now is I would start the business and I would start on YouTube and social media much earlier. I would start building the community much earlier. Uh, getting the skill set to build and galvanize a community, I think is the most important skill set for building a business because it's going to become your customer base. It's going to become what bolsters your reputation and it's going to become who you employ. So I would focus on that. And the way to do that is to make sure whatever you do is adding value to your community. You're not extracting from your community. You're serving them in some way. So if I was 18, I would focus on that. How to build a community by adding value. And if you need more on that, read some books by Seth Godin. He's the goat when it comes to things like that, that kind of culture. He's great. Although, based on some of this conversation, I think there's got to be a future book from 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 Dan. Oh man, I can't even think of the time to write that right now. <laughs> lean on your lean on your wife for her ghostwriting abilities. You can yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, my wife's an author for those that don't know. If you're into romance novels, check out brendasbooks.com. Just say it. There you go. Jeez, is it really I didn't realize that I mean maybe I did realize that Brenda's books is what it's called. You're Dan's fish, she's Brenda's books. Yeah. Reaching back. <laughs> <laughs> we it's it's a man. <laughs> We can remember. You know, yeah. I can't wait to see what your kids. Uh, <laughs> yeah, name is, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, here's another point about starting a business. The name doesn't matter. Like you think it does, but what's Amazon.com mean? Nothing unless you actually are that company and have operated how they've operated so long. Ironically, I think you said started, nothing. Yeah, I don't disagree with you, but it's it's funny how you say nothing and yet they call themselves the everything um, uh, store. But yeah, so, but I completely uh, agree with you. And people spend too much time trying to perfect um, that. These days, you can't even find the internet um, address anyway. And that's why people start to make up names and add in misspellings of words. It's like, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, Dan. I, I think we'll wrap up here in a second. But Art, did you have any other questions? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think this was a very insightful conversation and kind of your experience and uh, starting and scaling this fascinating business just had me all ears because uh, I, I, I love the ocean. I love fish. I'm not passionate about it as you are, but the fish have always intrigued me. Uh, so it's just, it's, I would love to kind of hear more actually about your business in the future and get into the weeds of the types of fish and learn more about the fish. And I'm subscribing to your YouTube channel right now. Yeah. You, you'll get an overload of that. If you join the channel, try that. You'll be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it, the things we didn't touch on that I just tease for other people who want to look into it. Like the fact that they source their water straight out of the Creek behind the, um, the warehouse there, which is one fascinating thing. And the way that they, again, just treat and manage it, um, all there. Uh, but one other, you know, thing to also, uh, highlight here is so when Dan and I did you know uh I I lived with him for a period of time as a as a kid with his family and at that point we shared a room um even though I you could we could have technically had our own rooms but one of the rooms was dedicated to the fish and it was amazing um I don't know if you have any pictures of that um but you know there, there weren't the phones that snap them as easy back then but in that room even gosh there was probably at least I don't know was it 20 10 gallon a bunch of 
maybe it was even higher. But aquarium total. Okay, yeah. fifty wood was, and then little gallon jars or Tupperwares to be able to raise like to fry and others in. It was it was it's pretty awesome actually as kids making some money. And then the, when you start learning about the different types of fish, he, he's bringing my fish nerd out, but I'm nowhere near as much of a fish nerd as him. But when you start thinking about like different environments they need to lay, because some fish need to lay eggs in a place where they don't have water part of the year and they dry up. And then when it rains again, they get um, more. Give us a name. One of the names, Dan, just because they're fun. They're, names. they're chili fish. Yeah. And, and give us one of their scientific names. Oh, uh, Nothobranchius rocovii. Yeah. <laughs> These are all the ones I remember. Northobranchius guntheri. What is it? We got Aphysemian gardneri for not, not those are uh, egg, or not egg bear. But, uh, uh, but yeah, and you also, you bred cichlids and others like that. So anyway, Dan goes on that. Obviously, uh, I I can write on his excitement a little bit, but what he's done is just amazing. So his channel, uh, highly recommend. I had forgotten about that. That's right. Back in the day, we could either each have our own room or we could share a room and have a fish room. So we were like sacrificing for this from the early days. <laughs> <laughs> we were Ed, but who would have, yeah, who knew? So it's really amazing. Like I say, where it's, where it's, uh, come back to for you. And, and even for me hearing some of the story, even though I've known you, it's like, I never really dug in to understand some of those things. And that's why I might be partially joking. But when I say the, uh, the book thing, like your journey is really impressive. Um, and I think just your, your, your way of approaching it, um, is something that I think a lot of people, including again, Art and I coming from companies where there's executives and fortune 500, it's like, gosh, if more of them had the same philosophy that you take, when you approach your work, I think you'd have a lot more businesses and people that were a lot better off. So, but isn't each team in a fortune 500 kind of like its own startup? Like it depends, it depends on the size, but it's also a lot like what you just described with, or not just described, but what you described with uh, the, the college and the process when you face that, you, oh, yeah. you have somebody ultimately. So yeah, you might be, and sometimes you have that freedom, but normally only if you are a growing, new, thriving business where they might have that, but the approvals and everything else that you got to go through, it's something else or exactly what you described in the beginning where you're like, well, they were going to cut it down to this and this. Well, that's what it can feel like being in a department. And it and it varies. There's ebbs and flows. And that's where, for me, a lot of the time in art and when we're talking to people about their future careers, it's like we try to help them to pay attention to which one of those environments they're in because one of them is probably a dead-end job while the other one will offer them the ability to Arrive, so it's the culture and the, the amount of red tape basically that differentiates department by department so dan then you mentioned um we've got dan's uh, fish.com and then we also have on youtube people can find you uh under dan's fish yep we try to keep it simple all the branding's under the same name and then your fish only fans channel oh yeah yeah you have to pay a steep fee to see that stuff though <laughs> <laughs> awesome <laughs> Uh, it's been a pleasure, Dan. <laughs> He's like, great. How's my brand ever going to recover from that? It will be a pleasure if you go to the only fans. Yeah. <laughs> Just, everyone knows we're joking. Hopefully there's no one. Yeah, yeah exactly. Somebody, somebody is going to go right now and create a, um, a channel for fish. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's something for everyone. I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. All right. Thanks guys.